the circumstances in which the accident happened, the we hit a tree, an older tree, and the tree is always going to win. A supervisor showed up, broke my window to get me out. And the way, just how much room there is in the back of the kennel for the dog to move versus I had like a minor concussion, bit my tongue. Haas did not survive. I was able to get in the back of the car with him as he was taking his last couple breaths. One of those nights that like changes everything. I don't lose any sleep about not getting to a scene in time to catch a guy anymore. I, mean, I can only imagine, you know, how tough it is, but I also think life is filled with split-second decisions where, you know, we, we do the best we can with the information that we have and, you know, your heart's where it needs to be. You're, you know, you're trying to make a difference and, and a bad scenario happened. Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. It was an awesome 12 weeks. I got to I grow my beard out. I didn't have to be in the <laughs> army. I got to yell at some cops and yeah. every time I made a couple cry. And every oh, time, yeah. like, not on purpose, like, yeah. just the abrasive, like, yeah. the ranger mentality that, like, I never, I haven't trained civilians in so long yeah. that. I didn't know you can't yell at people like that or call them a stupid motherfucker and shit like that. Like, I didn't know people were emotional. Um, well, especially cops. I mean, you think uh, cops like, are the worst. Really? Yeah, cops are fragile egos no for shit. the most part. There's 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 a lot of quality. There's a lot of fragile egos. Huh. Yeah, it's not it's not like the special operations community where you can tell someone they're fucked up and then tomorrow they're gonna do everything in their power to not be fucked up. Yeah. And the the law enforcement community is unique, and you, if you don't mind your p's and q's, it, you're gonna be called into IA or people are gonna complain about you. Yeah. I don't think the military is too different at this point, though. Like uh, some of the horror stories I've heard of yeah. of the shifts that have happened in the last, you know, five, six, seven years have been really disheartening. You know, but <clears throat> our entire society, I think, has uh, become a little fragile. Fragile to the point of, uh, you know, it's counterproductive. Like the overcorrection is is uh, problematic. Um, <clears throat> that's probably a whole other podcast. But uh, <laughs> all right, so. Uh, that last 12, was that like your last 12 weeks in the Army almost? or No, I got back and had another six to eight months. Oh, wow. Yeah, like I hadn't even done like my transition out of the Army classes yet. Oh, okay. Like they, I think I think my command thought I was staying in. Like that was like part of my career progression, like yeah. to help me promote, yeah. which was not the case. And my, yeah. my kennel master knew it. Like he yeah. knew like your police dog trainer cert will help you get on a canine unit faster. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that last six to eight months, were you still working with the dogs? And yeah, so I got back to the kennel. Um, Witty was full stride with his new handler, uh, John, and uh, I started handling. Let me back up. I got back. I don't think I'd been back very long, and the guys that were forward uh, had a mass cow event, um, and Iris, the dog that arguably saved my life when I was a team leader, was killed on target. Oh man. Um, they were doing a squirter chase. The guy was kind of down in a ditch, and she sh throws a proximity alert, and the guy ended up throwing a frag grenade out, and she, super ball-driven female Malinois, chases after it, standing over it as it detonates. Man. Um, that blast, though, injured five rangers but didn't kill anyone. Arguably because she shielded Tamped a, a lot of it. Of it yeah. um, she, she crawls back to the handler. Uh, Fuck. Her storm camera explodes on her back. like The, the lithium battery cell blew out. Um, and she passed away. She had a, I think it was a severed jugular. So she bled out pretty fast. Um, but he, the handler, a good friend of mine as well, um, had a pretty, pretty, pretty gnarly TBI from it. Um, we were all, all of us were in TBI clinic from Syria trip. And then now these guys from getting blown up on this one. Um, where, so where was that at? That TBI clinic or that the the target? Target. It was in Afghanistan yeah. somewhere. I don't know the exact province. Um, but the, so he came back and he's, like, you got, like, a little bit of stutter going on now. I can't hear. Ears are ringing really bad. Me and another handler already going to TBI clinic every other week in Augusta. Um, so he's not handling the dog at the time. So I started handling his dog, Roland. Um, I got super into tracking for a little bit. It was just kind of – it was fun to do. I'm trying different methods of tracking, and I ended up getting a slot with the Marsat guys at uh, the Georgia National Tracking Center doing urban tracking. I was like – I was ready to do urban tracking, but yeah, what's the worst that happens? I go and I 
look like shit for a week. It'll be okay. Yeah. It'll be fun. Yeah. And uh, is that at Shetler's place? Yeah. Yeah. So I was up there with like uh, Dustin Wynn. Yeah. And I forget the other the other trainer's name at the time. Um, he did all right, but the I'm handling this dog, and he's super super sharp. Like the it was funny watching this dog and his actual handler like this butt heads like yeah. the conflict like every day was like this like mortal combat fight for the toy it was awesome yeah and the dog would bite you for no reason it bit me there <laughs> like i couldn't move my two fingers for like the last three days of the course and that was just he wanted his dog to have a whistle down yeah so i'm working whistle downs with the dog and we had just failed the like the georgia ntc like level one certification which is like a i think it was a one hour age track four to six hundred meters with two turns in the woods and we got to the scent pool on a one hour set time and he kept working it backwards and I didn't have enough experience with tracking yet to like problem solve it. So I like decoy or the person with the tug is close, but like we failed. Yeah. The dog probably had never been shown failure to that extent. Like that level of frustration. We're tracking for 20 minutes before we timed out and we get back and I grabbed him by the collar to re put him in a position he wasn't. Oh, and he bit me right in the ring. It was yeah. mortal. No leash on him, no e collar, and it was yeah. a fight. Fuck. And he he chose air over. Yeah. Over. Yeah. Losing the fight, and then I healed him back to the car, put him in the car no or in problem. the kennel. And sort of no. He problem. did it. He did it. He did it. He got yeah. in there. I gave him this food bowl, closed it, walked in, looked at the three seven five guy, um, and I was like, he bit me, and I passed out on the couch. Oh shit. Oh yeah. I was, <laughs> And I was laying there, and he came back from the store with, like, peroxide. Like, we didn't know where the hospital was. Man. So I just wrapped it up, and luckily it didn't get infected. It's yeah. got a little scar to remember rolling by. Yeah, that's wild. All right, hey, guys. I want to take a, a second to talk about ads. Um, and this is not an ad. This is me talking about the ads. I know that, um, you know, sometimes we get comments of, of people bitching about the ads. There's too many ads, or they're too long, or what have you. And I, I want to clear two things up, which is, number one, is that my slash our team's ability to bring you guests and, and bring them in and, and the accommodations and, and the entire process that it takes to produce these shows to the level with which we do uh, requires funding, you know, and the, the sponsors give us an ability to bring these shows to you. So while I understand that everybody wants zero ads and, and everything bunched together and, and what have you, this is how we we bring this show to you. Uh, you know, we're a very small team. We're very fortunate to to be able to do it, uh, but we do still have to uh, to pay bills and and bring that to you. So keep that in mind. That's the first point. And the second point is that I can assure you with one hundred percent accuracy is that there is not a sponsor or a product that I talk about on here that isn't something that I use. Okay, that that I either regularly use or always use or have used and. And I refuse to budge on that. Okay, so we, we get uh, offers for for sponsors regularly that that get turned down because it's not stuff that I use or would use. So keep that in mind. Uh, have a little bit of flexibility in terms of our ads, and and realize that they're products that I believe in, that I stand behind, and they're what what make this show possible. So if you support these advertisers, these sponsors, that is supporting the show. Thank you. What are the two key components for canine success? That's effective training and proper nutrition. Fueled by Team Dog brings those two components to your family and best friend. The perfect nutritional balance that results in a higher mental acuity, energy, overall vitality, and even an improved appearance. Every product you will find in my company's store was born from the battlefield and not from the boardroom. Let my life's work help you become your dog's hero. That's a uh, yeah, just one of many stories I'm sure of uh, similar similar uh, temperamental dogs. But um, all right, so at, at that point you had just a, f a few weeks or months left of uh, being in, or yeah, I think I got done with that March talk course, and I was like months months away. I was yeah. I'd done my like the I don't even know what the acronym stands for the SFL L SFL tap. The Soldier for Life Transition Assistance Program. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, that was good. Um, um, so I did that, and I'm still doing, like, the training meetings. Yeah. Uh, filling in for the kennel master um, as an E5, like, trying to coordinate training and fill white space for in the future. Like, still working. Like, I never liked it when people were getting out of the military, and it's like, they're Stop eight, eight months out, and they're just like, fuck it. Yeah. And they disappear all the time. Like, I yeah. couldn't do it. Yeah. Um, it was nice. Of all the things, like, commanders have said, 
when I was leaving, he he did mention like that was like it was the most graceful transition. Like you worked until the end. Yeah. I don't know why people don't do that. Yeah. Um, maybe it's easier being in the kennel, like not just doing it for the guys. I'm also doing it for the dogs. Like, yeah. Don't want to just leave them. I'm hanging. filling this billet and I'm not going to do shit. Now when I leave, you guys have nothing planned at all. Yeah. Yep. Oh, that's good shit. Um, did you have a already have your gig lined up uh, in Savannah, law enforcement wise? Uh, not like not solidified, but I started the process. The hiring, the hiring process went really fast. I was used to like even get hiring as a police cadet in California back when I was 19 took six to eight months. Um, but here, I think it took two, three months. Yeah. But I had the conditional job offer signed prior to getting out. So I knew I wasn't going to be like unemployed for a little bit. Um, I actually got a call. I think it was the day before, like I got my DD-214 that you can stay in the kennel for 36 more months. I'm like, I've been asking for this for the last 18 months. Yeah. Like trying to like get this like to be battalion doctor and like dog handlers stay in the dog program for three plus years. Not like a lot of the snipers do 24 months and then they go back to the line. Yeah. That kind of a little more of a niche thing. Um, So I was like, I already turned my stuff in. I'm like, I'm gone. I, I started at Savannah PD in eight days. Yeah. So I was off for five or six days, and that Monday I started at Savannah PD. And Did you have to go through their academy or no, because you'd been through the California one already? Uh, I don't know if Georgia has an equivalency. I didn't even ask because it had been so long. Because mm. I know, like, the academy I went through, even to work in California, that, that expired after three years. Oh, okay. So, I, I mean, I got my tra- – they, they, they acknowledged my training hours years after I submitted it. So I got, like, the thousands of hours of training yeah. on my post record which some people, I don't really care about that stuff, but yeah. so when you turn in your paperwork, like it helped me for corporal to get promoted and like to show that I had all this training. Yeah. All right. So you get back, uh, or you, you land the gig at the, uh, at the police department and you get basically a week off from when you're out of the military until you start that. And you, did you jump right into the Academy? Um, Savannah, so Savannah police does a three week, they call it rock. So recruit orientation course class. Um, so you do three weeks of, you do some PT and they stress the two things that people fail the most, shooting and driving. Um, so you do a ton of reps on this cone course in old Crown Vicks and you do a lot of like basic marksmanship fundamentals, like practicing Georgia state pistol call, um, which is good for some people who, if you're coming in, have never shot, um, like we mentioned earlier, that 11 week Academy, you do a one week firearms. That's that's one of the weeks. And a lot of that is six calls. Like you have to pass two of them. I mean, so the the chance, not even the chance. There are police officers uh, in that in the state um, that have never shot, that are now carrying pistols that have spent a week training. Oh yeah, there's there's some that have been on the. Sh- I mean, there's if the cops don't shoot regularly, there's some cops that have shot less than a thousand rounds their entire life. Wow. Because, I mean, you got to think you shoot maybe 500. Generously, you shoot 1,000 rounds in the academy. And if you don't like shooting and you just shoot your annual. Is the qual a joke, the annual qual? I think it's very simple. Yeah. Um, coming, like, from, sh- like, in California, the, the, the qual, the 300-point aggregate we shot was on, like, a B8 bullseye-style target. So, I mean, margin of error, you're losing points pretty quickly. Yeah. The Georgia State qual. I want to say the 10 ring is like that big. Yeah. And then part of it goes up the throat into the head box. So from 25 and in, any of these rounds are 10 points. It's so like oh. you shoot a group that's huge, but they're all in the 10. Your 300 is the same as my 300 if I had a good day and shot a group. It's a fist size yeah. through the whole thing. Wow. Um, there's a lot of a lot of room for error. So some people, I think, get a little lucky. Yeah. Like you can pass two, 240 out of 300. Yeah, and you can miss every single round at twenty five yards and still pass. Wow, yeah, it's fucking wild. The uh, the driving, do they teach you? Uh, I mean, is it all just defensive pit maneuver, police style driving, or do they get into like how to how to drive a car from a handling standpoint, like on a, like a track? No pit technique. maneuver. No yeah. pit maneuver. That's like an advanced like EVOC class. Um, we're not even. I can't even chase cars. Really? Unless it's like a, a force, like a violent felony that just happened. Like, so, oh, okay. So speeding and running is not. Uh, oh yeah. Like, if I if you don't use a turn signal and I turn on my lights and sirens and you go, I just turn it off and. Really. I have to write a report. 
And there's a lot of liability aspect. Like I can yeah. see it. if you think of it from an administrator standpoint. No, I, I mean, I don't, I don't no disagree with that actually, but um, in a, in a case where somebody is, I guess in terms of your discretion as a, as a police officer, um, does a certain amount of speed over the speed limit or the way somebody's driving, uh, I guess, put it over the line of saying, okay, now this this is dangerous and I need to chase them or like? Almost like the opposite. Really? So. It's like if somebody's doing 180 miles an hour and they fly past you, like you're not going to chase them. Mm -mm. Really? No. Under no, like unless it's because they just robbed a bank or raped then, yes. somebody. But then, but then also now if there was that bank robbery and I'm chasing the car and I'm, I'm within policy, like even if I chased it and I was out of policy, I'm within state law. But if I'm within policy and chase and they start driving so reckless that now like. I can articulate that it's no longer like a danger just to themselves. It's this guy's driving 180 going towards like a school zone or near residential. And I keep chasing it now. Like it's a due regard issue. And like the shock, to conscience case law, like I could be held liable now for pushing the issue Yeah. when I should just let him, let him go, let him power down. He'll do something dumb another day or, or yeah. if we already have warrants on the guy kind of thing. Yeah. It's kind of a kind of a kick in the butt when you're like the young patrol guy. Yeah. And you take it personal like this guy's fleeing from me like No, for sure. I mean, here in Texas there was a there was a high-speed chase just a little while ago where uh, I don't know if it was a stolen car or if it was just somebody speeding, but they ran and they ran for a while and they end up finally spike stripping him um like 2 hours from Dallas, like way the fuck over in Abilene or something and and it caused an accident that killed several people, you know, mm -hmm. and and so there was a big kind of debate about like, hey, what, what the fuck, you know, like yep. is is that worth it, like, you know? But again, I I, I can see both sides, you know. I, I just um, and it seems like nationwide, it seems like there's more of a shift towards towards that of where most apartments aren't going to chase if if somebody doesn't stop or whatever, um, unless it's, you know, a felony type yeah, thing. A lot of the cities just don't, it's a, it's a huge liability thing. I'm a big believer in like if the conditions were right. Yeah. Like if you got to play, like wear both hats, like be the company man. And like also the hard charger, like yeah. you want to catch bad guys, but at the same time, if it's 2 PM and this guy's driving crazy and there's traffic on the road, probably not a good idea. But yeah. if it's three in the morning and there's nobody. We'll, we'll make it even easier. Four in the morning. There's not even like the drunk bar people going home. Like there's just <laughs> yeah. nobody besides you and the felon. Yeah. The the risk is a lot lower. Sure. Um, but that's where we get the state troopers are always yeah. helping us out and they'll chase you for no turn signal and forever. Oh yeah. Yeah. They'll chase you until they catch you or you disappear. Yeah. Um <clears throat> all right. So you go through uh that uh, indoctrination course, what have you, and then what how was what was the process after that? Uh then you go right right to the academy. Um, and then you're just kind of away from the department for 11 weeks. You report directly to the academy every morning, it's Monday through Friday. Um, they try and simulate a little bit of stress. Like the first couple of days, they yell at you and ask you questions, and you do push-ups. And coming from the military, it, it was, was a joke. Yeah, it was nothing. Yeah. But to people who have worked at Sprint, maybe, or like scooped ice cream at Ben and Jerry's and just decided I'm going to be a police officer now, it was a – giant culture shock yeah like people crying in formation wow people quitting in the formation in the middle of the day like you're yeah. on the clock getting paid by your city and you're just like i quit i can't do this how many students were there ballpark they run two two classes concurrently and i think it was 40 in each it was pretty big yeah it was wow well do you know how many graduated versus started or how many you lost we lost a decent amount really the ones i really kept track of was like the, the savannah ones i think we started with 24 i might be totally inaccurate but i think we were in the teens when we got done wow a couple people failed some things and were able to get into the next class and try again a couple people quit like failing tests and yeah just yeah. didn't didn't want to try again or or yeah. couldn't for whatever reason yeah um all right so you make it through you go back to the department um did you have to do a bunch of on the job stuff for uh for a while yeah so i did uh Luckily, I got to pick the precinct I went to, um, and I was top shot in the academy, and it came with, like, the perk of you can pick where you go. Um, so I picked to go to the east side. There was a lieutenant at the time that kind of sold me on it, um, and I think it was the right call. I ended up going to a really nice watch. I had a, a lot of a lot of good co-work coworkers on the street riding beats with me, and then I also had a really good sergeant that really looked out for his guys, and I kind of like – that's kind of like what I model, like the – 
non-military supervisor after now is him. Mm-hmm. Um, always looked out for us. Kind of had our back. If you're if you're fucked up, he'd let you know. Um, but there was no like PC bullshit. He was he was out there policing with you. He wasn't just in his office like randomly listen to the radio and kind of like step on your toes as you're trying to be the police. Yeah, which is nice. Um, so I did that for about 18, 19 months, and then my son was born. So I went on paternity leave. Um, and that was right about the time I had tested for canine. I was coming up on that 24 months, like the policy minimum to be able to, to go to the special unit. Um, and it just so happened this dog that me and a, me and a buddy of mine from Ranger Bat, he, he procured this dog in Holland, and I helped him as much as I could train this dog. He ended up selling it to Savannah. Um, this dog's name was Haas, and uh, – Dog was a lot of dog. Dog was a dog was a Ferrari, and if you if you're not a good driver, you do not need to be holding the lead. Yeah. And uh, this dog was pretty sharp, and he, he could be a bully. And uh, he was just he's kind of getting getting away with a lot of stuff for the maybe a year year and a half he was at the agency. Kind of bounced around from handler handlers a little bit, um, and I got the call, hey. Can, you want, you want to get Haas? I was like, sure. I'll handle Haas. So I get Haas. I have a, the spare canine car in my driveway and started from ground one. Started all over with Haas's obedience and teaching him, like, you ain't getting away with stuff anymore. Um, fixed a lot of issues. He came, I brought him out to SWAT training. I was on the SWAT team at the time. Um, doing a little, just basic obedience around, like, the less lethal munitions and all that kind of stuff. And he ends up ripping an 870 out of the SWAT commander's hands. As we're saying. <laughs> and it was, everything was going swimmingly until oh, then. And I, he's like, all right, bring him. He's a former canine guy. And he goes, bring him up here. Put him in a knee on my left. I'm, I'm watching him like a hawk and he shoots beanbag round. And he just looks at it. Nothing. Shoots another one. He goes up through my leg, grabs the barrel of the 870 and rips that out of his hands. And there was like canine indentations, like scratches Jeez. on the barrel. Yeah. And I was like, well, I'm fired. <laughs> but no, the SWAT commander, he, he, this is fucking awesome. I love yeah. this dog. And he, he was, man, he was the sharpest can be. Like at the house, it was every night was a test. Yeah. Every night. I guess uh, taking a step back before, uh, you know, during that time, you said you were on a SWAT team. And, and while you were doing your first year and a half and change, um, you know, just as a, as a normal cop, um, did were there any, crazy fucking circumstances or, or situations you found yourself in in that, that first couple of years before you went canine? There's a lot more, like, medical triage than I ever expected to do. Yeah. Um, and that was where, like, I, like in my head, I, I, I still think all the Ranger medics I had for, like, driving at home, like, that was always a big deal. And Ranger Bat was RFR, Ranger First Responder. Like, we're always doing medical training on downtime. And I get out to the street, and I'm next thing I know, I'm putting tourniquets and chest seals. I, I almost decompressed a guy on a shooting scene. Um, like, he had tracheal deviation, and I'm recognizing all these signs, and it's all flooding back to me. I was like, I know what I need to do. I don't know if I can legally do this. Yeah. But it's like I do it and potentially save his life, or I don't, and he dies. Isn't there – does the Samaritan uh, rule not apply to law enforcement? I think that rule is like – built for like CPR and like putting pressure. I don't know if it's like injecting a 14 gauge needle in someone's chest cavity. Yeah. I mean, the way I understand it is, is that it's kind of all encompassing. Like it yeah. does, it's, it's trying to save somebody's life. I know? think I would have been good legally. I think I would have been the crucified policy wise. Yeah. Oh yeah. Cause I'd have been like, such like, what did you do? Yeah. Um, You're not a paramedic. Yeah. Well, yeah. luckily the paramedic, I have a very good relationship with the paramedics in our area and she comes screaming up and I t- had to, had it out of the thing in my hand, the needle on the catheter in my hand. Yeah. And I was like, this is what I got. Chest seal applied, exit wound sealed, and I have tracheal deviation. He goes, I trust you. Oh, shit. And, and immediately he goes, man. And I remember looking at it. I was like, it feels euphoric, huh? <laughs> and that's crazy. I lived. Wow. Um, yeah, that's wild. But I found myself doing a lot of that. and I, It was awesome at first until all my medical supplies that were like mine that like I procured getting out of the army procured yeah to save lives <laughs> yeah. and uh we're dwindling yeah. i was like well yeah, i'm not just gonna keep buying this stuff so i have enough now that's like for me every now and again 
Like yeah. I just had a guy that was stabbed the other night that he got a chest seal and the paramedics are good are good now. Like that I'm not just wasting the stuff and I'm using yeah. it the way it should be used. It's so pretty good about plusing me up. Yeah. Yeah. But the that was probably my biggest thing. I was like, I had no idea I'd be yeah. like ad hoc paramedic out here. Yeah. Because like they always, there's always the joke of like, yeah, like there's your second responder because we had to make sure the scene's safe for you. Yeah. Not like downplaying what par- paramedics and EMTs do, but like there's a lot of medical intervention that like can and should be happening prior to them getting there. Yeah. And I think that's like this, it's fixing itself, but it's a shortcoming. I, I noticed initially when I got hired. Yeah. Um, in that, that same block of, of, uh, be, you know, being a cop for two years was, uh, were there instances where you either went hands on with somebody and got into a no shit like fist fight or did you ever draw your gun and, and have to use it? Yeah, almost not so much the fist fight aspect. There was, there was a couple like knockdown drag outs. Not, generally the, the suspects aren't like trying to like, it's not like the one percenters that I was, it was the guys that were like, they're trying to get away. Yeah. So it's like, Maybe there's they'll they'll punch you or kick at you, but it's it's all like defensive, trying yeah. to run away. Um, I do remember getting cut loose off training, and my sergeant thought it was a good idea to let me and my buddy from the academy, who just got cut loose, to ride together. <laughs> two new guys. Oh yeah, first first call we got was a guy with a gun, or he had two guns, and he's riding a bike, and he's wearing uh, tan over tan dickies, and I'll never like forget like that description of like tan over tan dickies, and I'm driving down, and I see a guy in like Dickie's uniform riding his bike on the sidewalk. I was like, that's probably him. Yeah. So we, we go to stop him riding the bike on the sidewalk, which is legal. And, uh, you right away, you can see there's two guns in his pocket. I was like, Hey man, I'm just going to pat you down and take the gun, take that gun off you. And he started pulling his pants up. Like, You're going to run. And as soon as I like made contact to touch him, he takes off running. So within two feet, three feet, about three steps. He's on the ground in handcuffs pretty quick. And I'm already, we're already calling our sergeant. Hey, you got to come out here and take pictures of us. We got no use of force. We've been at work <laughs> for 12 minutes. So we weren't allowed to ride together anymore. Oh, that's classic. Hey guys, I wanted to uh, talk about something that I've incorporated into my daily routine, my morning routine that has had a remarkable impact on my life. Uh, it's called BioPro Plus. Uh, it's a non synthetic HGH uh, treatment. And, uh, you know, every year after puberty, your HGH levels naturally drop uh, and exponentially sometimes uh, can even drop by, by 50% by the time you're 35. Uh, I train jujitsu three or four times a week. I lift three or four times a week. And BioPro Plus, uh, without question, uh, enhances my ability to train more uh, days per week, harder, recover faster, uh, enhance performance. I cannot say enough good things about this product. I've been taking it for a few months. Uh, it's, it's remarkable, and I will continue to, to do so. Um, if you want to uh, you know, perform better, look better, feel better, uh, I, I can't stress it enough. I, I've tried BioPro Plus, uh, and I encourage you to go to bioproteintech.com, uh, and if you want to get $30 off your first order, use the code MikeDrop, M-I-K-E-D-R-O-P, and again, that's bioproteintech.com. I cannot stress enough. This stuff has uh, been a game changer for me as I've gotten older. I want to take a second to talk about something near and dear to my heart, and that is a staunch supporter of this podcast, which is Bub's Naturals. Uh, the hat sitting in front of me uh, here on our coffee table here in the studio belonged to Glenn Doherty. His nickname was Bub. Uh, I did two platoons with him. And his childhood best friend uh, and another colleague of theirs, uh, Sean is the best friend, TJ is their colleague, uh, started Bub's Naturals, which is a collagen and MCT oil company uh, in Bub's or Glenn's honor. And, um, you know, for me, it's, it's uh, an absolute honor to be sponsored by and working with a company that, um, you know, was started in the honor of one of my closest friends and, and a guy that I went to war with. And, uh, you know, the, the Bubs brand is not only super quality, um, you know, collagen, uh, collagen powder as well as MCT oil powder, um, you know, but they also give back to the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation. Uh, they donate proceeds from their product sales to the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation, which, uh, you know, to me just furthers 
uh, you know, the, the mission set on veterans day, they give a hundred percent back. So, uh, I do believe it's the best collagen on the planet. Uh, I like to mix it in with uh, morning coffee, the MCT oil powder, the same thing, uh, mixes in very easy. It tastes great. Uh, and it just kind of adds everything that you want to start your day off from a brain health standpoint, from a joint support, gut support, um, you know, MCT oil and, Collagen are, are two components, especially as as we age, uh, that are integral components to uh, to health. And so, uh, to be able to work with Bubs Naturals and uh, be able to to work with them and, and sponsor a product that uh, number one is a high quality product, and number two is is so near and dear to uh, you know to my heart and to the Mike Drop Podcast for for who it uh, was started for and what it stands for. Um, you know, it's just uh, it's an amazing amazing place to be. So. Um, it is whole 30 approved. Um, it's, uh, sport certified, so you're not uh, going to run into any problems with that. Um, and I will say that, um, you know, right now they're, they're offering, uh, 20%, <clears throat> 20% off if you go to bubsnaturals.com and, uh, use the mic drop code. So, uh, I really highly encourage you to, to try it out, incorporate it into your day, day to day for joint health, for brain health, uh, for cognition, for gut health. And, uh, and to support an amazing organization that does a lot of things uh, in Glenn Bubb's honor. So uh, go to bubsnaturals.com. Mic drop is the code 20% off. I but, mean, so in, in a case like that, I mean, legally, if you see that he has a gun or guns and he goes to, you know, pulling his pants up, I mean, there's got to be kind of a dicey factor of is he pulling his pants up? Is he drawing the pistol? What? Yeah. Uh, and it, so like, uh, to me, that varies from like cop to cop. The that specific instance, I had a pretty good position. Like I was coming out of the driver's side, so I had, I still had a car separating us. So I had I had a reactionary gap. Um, I could see the pistol grip of a gun, so I knew there I knew there was a gun involved. But also, like the severity of the crime I had at the time was just like misdemeanor. Like you have no bike light and you're riding a bike on the sidewalk. The like the person being armed it's like walking a fine line of like legally allowed to be armed in america but then like if i can articulate that you're armed and dangerous now like that gives me a reason to pat you down to like take these firearms away mm -hmm. temporarily to like for scene safety um but it can't just be officer safety i can't like if i stop you and you're open carrying a gun i, I don't have the legal right just to take it from you so i feel safe yeah um that's one of those like weird misconstrued things yeah um but yeah, when you start getting those pre-flight pre-flight indicators, it's that's when stuff's about to get real dicey. I don't like yeah. I don't like chasing people when I know they have a gun. Yeah, might is different. Like send even sending the dog might have a gun is yeah. one thing. When you know they have a gun, it's like uh, a lot of these things change. Sure. Um, I'm not trying to just sprint into a losing situation. Yeah. Um, so I, I found. Mean, go, go ahead. Uh, found myself chasing a lot of people, a lot of foot chases, a lot of a lot of like wrestling wrestling with guys that are just trying to score them away yeah um probably the funniest call i rode that stands out on patrol um actually wasn't even a call for service one of the other beat officers says he heard a loud car crash a guy stole a dump truck like a trash truck a city trash truck and it was paid 50 dollars and some ecstasy or something like that to crash it into someone's specific car like a targeted thing you can't even like make this stuff up. Fifty bucks, go steal a trash <laughs> truck and go crash into this guy's car. Well, he romped through this whole block, hit trash cans, cars, and then we're foot chasing this guy through this neighborhood. We have a perimeter set up, and I'm standing there. I'm pretty new, cut loose, and then we have the next class that got cut loose, and he's a SWAT team leader now, and he's standing there with me. I'm not his training officer. Somehow he got split up from his training officer, and we look over and I see this guy crawling out from the side of a house, <laughs> like low crawling. So I yell. I, Yo, police stop. And he takes off running. And I'm running with a flashlight. And he goes behind this dark, dark, uh, like, cut between two houses and around a corner. And I remember, like, I even pulled it back. I was like, that was a pretty smooth transition going from flashlight to 1911 with light on. And the guy just kind of, like, melted at the fence when I came around <laughs> and like, looked down the barrel of a 45. A Homer Simpson style? Yeah, just like, I quit. <laughs> Which is generally a lot of the time is how it goes. Like yeah. if the flight doesn't work right away, it's like yeah. no one's in. No one's. You're not gonna outrun me. Yeah, and definitely not outrunning the kid I was with. Like yeah, you, you guys carry 1911s. I was at the time. So really? we had. So we had the department had. We were carrying Glock 21s. 
Um, so we had the department had still has it a master qualification. So if you shoot above a 290, 290 or 280 twice in a row with the Glock 21, you can shoot qual with your 1911 and you have to do a master qual, which is the basics. It's pretty simple, but if you don't like dry fire a lot, you're probably not going to do it. Something as simple as just draw from the draw from a level three holster at seven yards, one round on target under two seconds. And then stage two is draw fire one, I think transition and fire one or it's reload and fire one. And then the third one is fire one in each target, reload, fire one in each target after the draw in five seconds. Yeah. Um, it's not out of this world, but I did it when I was in patrol school. So I showed up day one to like tr- as a trainee yeah. with a 1911. And they're like, who's this fucking guy? Yeah. Just, yeah. just because I thought it'd be cool. Yeah. You got some street cred from like, for sure. The, yeah. Like the criminals are like, why is your gun different? Yeah. So shoot better. Uh, yeah. I can fuck around and find out. Yeah. I don't say that on yeah. camera. I got in yeah. trouble. I got I got my hand slapped enough times. I don't say bad words on camera anymore. Really? Um, like on body cam wise, you mean? Really? Yeah, even fighting a guy. Please sir, stop. Yeah, really? got, yeah. It's it's come second nature now, but I was really bad about it, saying fuck and stuff like that. I'm like God, you get, get on the fucking me. ground. Yeah, I never got written up, written up, but I got yeah. like No oh, shit. Yeah, you can't you can't be saying stuff like that. Dude, that's wild. Yeah, it's it's different. Yeah. But yeah, once yeah. once you get used to it, like yeah. No, I'll, I'll say yeah. some funny stuff, yeah. but it's like, it's mother like, trucker and stu- like student no, shit like, or what? Don't be silly. And <laughs> I'll say it like, cause like I don't, I've had a couple, there's been a couple like the pucker don't factor moments. Yeah. But like in comparison to like the stuff in Ranger Regiment or like even the training in Ranger, like the mass cows and all like training was so much harder than the real stuff Yeah, that like now like a foot chase is exciting, but like, there's not a ton that really like gets the adrenaline going that where it stays and you find yourself like, yeah, I need to get back to earth. Like I stay yeah. pretty clear the whole time. That's where I'm able to like make something like, stupid. Hey, don't do, do anything silly. Yeah. <laughs> and it sounds, it's funny on camera, but like yeah. it's all like, it yeah. kind of alludes to like I had a calm demeanor. Like, yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't you, swearing. You can't out. say I was scared. Yeah. Like, hey, I thought he was going to kill me. Yeah. No, I told you don't do anything silly. You're yeah. under arrest. Yeah. Wow. The uh, the combatives training in the academy is it uh, equally as light as the shooting portion? Like, do you guys work on? Uh, Man, I don't think it. Was, I don't even think it was pass fail. I think it was just like, can you go through this week and not get injured? Yeah. Um, but it was nothing crazy. I mean, I got choked out by one of the instructors. Yeah. I caught him in a chicken wing in front of the class, and he didn't like that, so he yeah. he, he got me. He yeah. put me out. Yeah. Um, that was when we were allowed to do <clears throat> bilateral neck restraint. That's not allowed anymore. So you can't do a rear naked choke. Nope. Wow. Um. So, out of policy. Let's see. Is there any type of so? There's in in the in the nomenclature bilateral. It's basically any choke, then, right? Yeah. You can, no no. Can in you California, use one they, hand. Nope. In California, they called it an upper body control hold. That was like that was how I learned it in California. Um, same thing. Um, yeah, I can't it's, unless you have like you can articulate the need for deadly force. Yeah. When in that place you're. You should, Arguably, you should. you're better off just pulling your gun. Yeah. At that, because yeah, it's not worth the media shit storm. <clears throat> yeah. But it sucks when you're like my size, like hold my own. But if I'm fighting someone significantly larger than me, yeah. but I'm faster and I'm able to get in that position, I can't. Can't do you, it. I've been in a fight once actually where it was right when it was taken out of policy and we we're no longer allowed to use them. Bilateral, bilateral neck restraint. A fight with a guy. We're about to roll into traffic. What was the circumstance leading up to it? It's pa- stealing packages. <clears throat> um, stealing packages, and I, he's wearing a Superman jacket. Like, so, <laughs> there he is. Um, and I was by myself, and he was nowhere near where, like, the call happened. I was on the way to the call. So I stopped with him. I aired where I was, and it didn't get updated in the computer. So as I tell him to get off the bike, he kind of, like, pushes the bike at me and starts to run. He doesn't make it very far again. And I take him to the ground. Um, and he's probably 6'3", 185, probably strung out, and we're rolling into traffic, and I'm trying to air on the radio, like, where I am, just trying to hold on at this point, like, trying to get in some sort of wrist lock or, or get him in a cuffing position. And I thought, I kept thinking to myself, I was like, I need to put this dude out, but I can't, I'm not allowed. So now my options are I just hope this doesn't go really bad or hopefully someone gets here. I ended up getting my handcuffs before anyone showed up, but it was – it's not cool to be thinking that yeah. as you're fighting. Um, but I think that goes back to me being able to st- remain clear, like not panicking. 
Yeah. Like I've been through enough like shitty stuff and stuff that was difficult on purpose. Yeah. That like, okay. Yeah. Like I fought with my little, I've wrestled my little brother before who wrestled in high school and just kicked my ass all the time. Yeah. Like I'll win this one. I just hope we don't roll on and get hit by a Subaru yeah, in, no the, in the process. It's fucking Subarus. They'll get you. Yeah. The, uh, I, I'm, I'm always surprised at, at how few law enforcement officers, um, practice jujitsu, you know, uh, cause to me, really, I would put it in the same category as shooting, maybe even a step above because the likelihood of needing to use it is easily significantly higher than being a good shot. You know, both are important, yeah. but like how many times have you wrestled with somebody versus shot somebody? A lot to zero. Yeah. You know, so it's like, to me, if, if if you spend a ton of time shooting, like you should spend at least that much time doing some sort of combative training. Now, I, I think that's another huge misstep on pretty much every department with very, very rare exceptions standpoint is, is that they don't allocate time for that. Like it should be part of your job, you know, no different than you have training days for canine, you have training mm-hmm. days for SWAT, you have training days for shooting, What you know, whatever. Even if it's a few days a month, like that's still better than nothing. So our department's gotten one of the guys in the training has done a really good job. He's brought back open mat. Um, and there's a couple guys on the SWAT team that do jujitsu and they're there to help out. And one guy's a really good wrestler. My new canine guy, he's a good wrestler. Um, so he's helping guys. And being a guy that doesn't do jujitsu, and I have like the age old excuse, like time, like with kids now and stuff like that, but yeah. excuse their dime a dozen, right? Um, the stuff I learned in the California Police Academy, like just simple stuff, like just wrist manipulation and stuff like that. I've all, I found if you can't do jujitsu or like, and or you weren't a wrestler in college or high school, if you just practice a couple things, yeah, you just have a couple. Like, I only have three or four go to things, but I tell you what, if I catch your wrist at a ninety degree angle, it's over. Yeah, except for one guy, I did it to him and he looked at me. Yeah, and luckily I was not by myself. But the, <laughs> but the there's a lot of people I think there's. The, have the, the mentality of it's not going to happen to me. Yeah. I'm not going to get my ass kicked or I'm going to have backup. Yeah. Sometimes your backup makes it harder to fight a guy because they oh, yeah. don't know what they're doing. Yeah. And now you're just like doing the tear the guy in half thing instead of like working together. Yeah. Um, the unit I work with is really good about that. Yeah. Like guys don't fight very long and they go into handcuffs and there's very minimal injury all the time because yeah. we're not fighting each other. Yeah. And guys have enough, uh, they can they can put their ego in their back pocket enough to be if there's a the leg people. guy. <laughs> yeah, well, it happened yeah. the other day. Yeah. One guy took the legs. The other, this other officer had the upper body, and I okay. There's nothing I can do right now. I don't need to just dog pile on there and be in the way. Yeah. And then once I saw the ability to like just calmly reach in, secure an arm, now you're in handcuffs. Yeah. Um, that comes that comes with time on the street. I'm not saying four years on the street is like. I'm not a seasoned police officer by any means. Um, but I think it's fast-tracked a little bit with the experience I had just, like, maintaining composure Yeah. Um, in the face of adversity, um, which some of these kids don't. I say kids because some, yeah. some of them are 21, 22 years yeah. old, and they're, they're telling someone how to live their life, and yeah. they still live at home. It's, yeah. it's a weird dynamic. I can, Yeah, it, for sure it is. I mean, you know, the older I get, the more, I guess, blatantly obvious that is sometimes – just with people in, in different positions in, in society that are considerably younger than I am. And I'm just like, who the fuck is this guy? You know, but um, it, to me, the, the not to spend a, a ton more time talking about it, but just like to me, especially for young men like that, that haven't spent a lot of time, uh, you know, in, in stressful situations is that, you know, to, to me, that that's probably the, the most important thing that, that uh, transpires or not transpires, uh, um, goes beyond just the fighting aspect or the hands-on aspect is that, you know, you, you learn to be calm when you're really uncomfortable or you're mm-hmm. about to be choked out or, you know, you're in a, a really painful position or you're being smothered to the point where it, it, it's enough, like the, the, just the pressure that somebody's putting on you from the top, if they're good at it, it is enough to make you so uncomfortable that, that you know, people will tap from it or, or whatever. But so being comfortable or in those positions a lot gives you an ability to stay calm in a lot of other ways, mm-hmm. you know, you know, and, and I think that that by itself is massively important. But then the other thing too, is just the time under tension 
of, you know, even, even if you don't learn a ton, it, it's not even so much to me about knowing a bunch of techniques. It's knowing a couple from every position, but just understanding positional authority, positional dominance, you know, using your hips and, and leverage and fulcrums and, uh, and center of gravity to, to move people around that are bigger and stronger than you and, and whatever, again, you know, outside of choking people or, or whatever is just, you know, that, that positional mm-hmm. dominance is, is, is so valuable. And to me, like if I was a cop, there's, I mean, I already train, you know, a, a number of days a week and, and have for years, but for sure, if I was a, a can, you know, a, a, not just a canine officer, I mean, a, a police officer, I would be doing it all the fucking time. But, um, Anyway, one, one backtrack. Uh, you said you were on the SWAT team. At what point did you get on there? I want to say I'd been on the department for eighteen months. Because that's a, that's a pretty quick. Yeah. So because of your ranger time. I wasn't specifically for that. Um, the just retention and recruiting in general, at the department as a whole is pretty pretty poor. Um, so I think the requirements now to get on to to try out for SWAT is twelve months. So once you're off probation, you can try out for SWAT. And I think I had put in initially to try out for SWAT, and then I withdrew my application just because I was like, mm, I don't know if I, I don't know if I want to do this right now. Um, so I was thinking about leaving, policing. Just wasn't having fun. Didn't know if the canine thing was going to happen. And I was like, maybe I want to do something else. Um, decided to stick with it. My wife actually was like the voice of reason. She's like, if you quit now, are you going to regret? not doing the SWAT canine thing or are you happy just like that wasn't for me and I was like I'll probably regret it and she goes well you can always say it's not for you down the road in a year or two you you might not be able to go back so again my saving grace is her um I put it put in for the next SWAT tryout tried out made the team um I want to say about after I think it was February of 2022. I had Bolt already. Uh, I, I got an assistant team leader position. Um, and it's, I mean, it was it's fun. It just priorities kind of shift. Um, Are after, you still on SWAT or no? No. Nah, oh, I'm I'm the SWAT canine handler now. Okay. It's not like an official position, but like yeah. the team leaders know if they have something that's like doggable, yeah. like a barricade or or we're searching for somebody, they can call me and I'll just come out. Yeah. Um, and I'll go to SWAT training on the Tuesdays of every month. So they train two weeks, two days a month, uh, second Thursday and last Tuesday. Um, pretty soon I'll have to be at both because the new canine guys on the SWAT team still. So then we'll have two SWAT dogs, which will be nice. Yeah. Um, priorities just kind of shifted with kids. And yeah. Um, the time when you were on the SWAT team, uh, I mean, the entire time, I guess, including up until now, have you been on many SWAT operations? Is it? that busy in, in Savannah using SWAT or there's, there's like weird windows. Um, when I was on the team, yeah, we were, we were the, the operational tempo was relatively high. Um, any like we did two live HRs. Really? Mm-hmm. Can you uh, walk us through either of them? Yeah, we had, um, it was essentially a shooting, kidnapping. Um, some lady, a lady shot another lady and stole her kids. Like, wow. I think six and eight week old babies, six, they're twins, if I remember correctly. Um, the detectives at the department did a great job, and we were able to get to within a specific house, and we happened to pull up, setting in, like, two little, like, immediate reaction teams in, in unmarked cars, and just happened to see the car that she was alleged to be driving in the garage as the garage door closed. So we just kind of waited for the green light to, like, this is, this is where they are. Um, Did she kill the woman? The woman lived. Yeah. Uh, the woman lived. I think she was shot in the head and chest. Jesus. Uh, yeah, she lived miraculously. Um, we end up um, going dynamic on the house, and I was the second one in the door. And I remember I didn't hear the radio traffic, um, but I guess the sniper called out that the suspect was running through the house with a gun, like – uh, perpendicular to our entry on on the front, and I remember just right away I saw a guy go down in the prone, and I look past them and I see the babies in like people's arms on the couch, and I just remember pressing pressing to the to what the hostage was, grabbing this 
young baby and running it out the front door. Yeah. And uh, we're able to, both, both children were fine. Um, she was taken in custody without incident. She like took the gun apart and like hid in the closet naked. It was weird. Like clearly having some sort of mental problem to yeah. do all that. But went about as smooth as it could have gone. And they were recovered in the same day. Um, yeah. and that was something I never thought I'd be doing it. Like at, yeah. at this agency, this size and sure. this state, like there's no way. Um, but it went it ex- executed flawlessly. Everyone did their job. Um, the other one was very similar. It just we, there's a there's a conflict of a tactical and patrol conflict, and I think the the suspect was able to get out the back. We didn't know that at the time. We went, we went kinetic on the front door, and the kid that was hostage was sitting on the couch. Oh wow! Um, remember the guy? We're we're gonna drop a bang in the breezeway. Of the the like is like these houses are weird. Super historic homes. There's a stairway in the middle, and there's four units um we we're going on the second floor one so we we're going to drop a bang down the middle of the stairwell and it was just going to be super loud but outside so we didn't have an overpressure issue but when we went in and we saw the kid my buddy he's he's not, he's not a police officer anymore he, he uh went on to do uh college stuff and but he came out with the i think he came out with the hostage and the <laughs> banger in his hand and i want to say the pin was pulled wow so it's like it was like all right one one of what not to do, but at least he like he didn't like he didn't like play with the spoon and like cook it off in his hand or like that. He was like, yeah, he was a squared away guy. Like he wasn't yeah. this thing wasn't going to go off. But like, sure. if we're going to be as safe as possible, like, yeah. don't do that. Yeah. How how does the the movement in terms of like the tactical movement um, on a SWAT team versus your experience in the Rangers? How similar or different is it? Like you mean t- tactical movement yeah. or? Like yeah, just like running through houses with the guys. Like, is it is it way different on, from your SWAT experience? It's pr- it's similar in the sense of like the tactics are all very similar. Like, I always like room I joke, clearings, room clearing. Yeah, I always joke. It's like there's no fancy SOP. One guy goes right or left, and the other guy goes the other way. Yeah. Like, there's no like we can church it up and charge as much money as we want to teach it. <laughs> I can go buy a ninety nine cent book at, as yeah. a ranger guy from the seventies and yeah. has pictures of this. But the, there's just, it's a, a little bit, some guys are a little like, they don't learn as fast. Yeah. And I think it's just because the stress inoculation is not there. Like, there's not that, like, if I don't perform, I'm gone. Yeah. Um, it is what it is. But there's some really, there's some really scored away guys on, on the team at the department I work for that I think would make phenomenal Rangers. Yeah. Like they're, they're physically fit. They're, they're mentally tough and they, they're able to problem solve on the fly. Yeah. Um, it's not like a it's not like a broad spectrum skill that everyone has yet. Um, people people develop a, a little bit slower, but the the leadership there, the the, the decision making and, and tactical judgment is really good. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I mean, I suppose too. Um, you know, the volume of training hours you have at a Ranger regiment versus a police department, especially a SWAT team, is vastly different too. Like you're just not doing it as much, right? Yeah, so like when you're comparing. A week in Ranger Bat, even on a down week, like you're getting you're getting scuffed up all day by your tab spec four and your team leader. You're doing glass houses, you're doing weapon manip- manipulation, you're doing machine gun drills. Versus at the police department, unless it's annual mandate training or you're doing something on your own on your own time with your own money, you're shagging calls and writing reports and yeah, like there's no there's no time. And then at SWAT training, you, you have all this list of things like coming from me trying to plan a SWAT training day, like you have all this list of things you want to get done, eight to 10 hours isn't enough time. Yeah. So you're you're having like trim fat, and then sometimes you're progressing faster than some people can process. Yeah. And you kind of got away, like, do I leave this guy behind and hopefully he figures it out? Or do I make it menial for these guys and not get them any better? Sure. So you got to, it's like a weird balancing act. Yeah. As you guys know, I've been using mud water uh, personally for a while now. Um, It's a great alternative to coffee with four adaptogenic mushrooms with only a fraction of caffeine. Uh, As you get in a cup of coffee, you get energy without the jitters uh, or crash that you get with coffee. Each ingredient was added for a purpose, cacao and chai for a hint of caffeine and hot chocolate-like flavor, lion's mane to support focus, cordyceps to help support physical performance, and chaga and raishi to support your immune system. I love how it tastes. Uh, I, I personally am a big fan of the lion's mane aspect as I 
get older and uh, mentally I'm all over the place with all the different things I have going on. I find that the, the, the focus and kind of brain power that I get from that is top notch and uh, crucial. Uh, it's Whole30 approved. It's 100% USDA, no, uh, organic, non-GMO, gluten-free, vegan, and kosher certified. Uh, and they do donate monthly to psychedelic research and treatments as they believe the country is in a mental health epidemic, which I think we can all agree, and see psychedelics as useful tools. So they, uh, they help out uh, immensely with donating to those programs. You can get 15% off and a free frother if you go to mudwater.com. And use the code mic drop, all one word, for 15% off. Again, that's mudwater.com, M U D W T R.com. And use the code mic drop, all one word, for 15% off. Do it. Is there a craziest call that you've been on that stands out? Nothing, nothing super out of the normal. It was, there was a shooting that just occurred, and I happened to be down the street. I didn't turn my body cam on for this. So I don't know. I never got in trouble, which is good. But the, I'm coming down the main corridor right where the shooting was and I was by myself and I get it. And that's why I didn't turn it on. I was like, there's so much stuff going on at one time. That was, this was not crossing my mind. Um, and the guy that was shot was laying down by a tree motionless. So I kind of like had to make the call. Like, is this, is this like, is this a homicide? Like, is he obviously dead or is the shooter still like, I had to make a lot of decisions and I hear another car coming. So luckily for, for him, I made the call just to really quick grab him and check for a pulse, and he was alive, just in and he was done. Um, turns out he got shot in the in the deltoid, and it ran the length of his bone, and the bull actually came to rest in his myocard- myocardial sac, like Jesus. in his heart. Um, but I was able to apply a tourniquet and barely get his brachial artery pressed against his humerus to the point where the paramedics were like, that that saved his life. Like, he was bleeding inside because uh, there wasn't a whole lot of blood on the outside. But the way that bullet traveled was was so crazy. And that guy's arm was, it was like a spaghetti noodle. But there was a whole lot to take in at one time and then to be able to, be, okay, I'm going to, I need to, right now, the priorities of life, I need to put my, my back to whatever's going on to keep this guy alive. Um, and it kind of goes to what, like, it's really harped on the SWAT team as a priority of life. Um, it was brought up a lot of time after like Uvalde and Parkland, like all these like terrible events where like cops are cowards. Is the priority of life is like your hostages, your innocent civilians, and then you have officers. And if you're on a SWAT team, tactical officers arguably is below that, and then your suspects. Like all your decisions should 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 mirror that. Yeah. If you're not making decisions to save the hostage or the innocent people there. Yeah, um, and that was just one of those times I had to apply it. Like this guy's kind of shitty, like trying to do a medical intervention when you don't know if the shooter's there. You still got people screaming and yelling, telling you to save them. You don't know if they're one of the people that, yeah. that shot them. They got the gun tucked. Just part of the gig, though, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, that is dicey. What do you know? What the circumstances were? I don't. I don't yeah. I'm I'm very good at compartmentalizing work, like because yeah. I'm not a detective. I don't. I don't. I don't have to get invested in these cases and like yeah. try and solve them. I've been pretty good about not getting hung up on like the, the stuff I've seen or like the weird gruesome details or like trying to get into the reads of why someone wants to kill someone else and all that stuff, which it works out well for me. I'm able to like the call's done. I clear it. Good to go. Every now and again, I have that one that's like, yeah. I hope I never have to see that again. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, I'm pretty good about compartmentalizing it and I don't linger too much. Yeah. What, uh, I mean, is, is there one that stands out as being in that hope I never see that again category? Like, what, what, what has shocked you the most? Look, I mean, looking, like, looking back at it, it shocked me. It didn't shock me at the time, but probably because I think I was so perplexed. Like, I think anyone would be like, I don't know how to react to this, so I'm just going to be as normal as possible. And probably like make jokes in my head to like get through it uh it was my i think it was my first like violent crime scene as a police officer and uh i'm pretty sure this case has been adjudicated and everything like that um but this victim was actually cut into pieces so the victim's feet were cut off and arm was cut off and just thrown in the woods 
Um, I remember seeing it. I'm sitting there like with the crime scene log is like brand new police officer, like shiny badge still. Like I got my <laughs> like shiny Ranger tab on there. Like, Oh my God, I don't know. What, to, what do I do? Yeah. Like, just don't let anyone steal any body parts. I guess I don't know what to do. Um, but I got the, those, those images are like ingrained in my yeah. head, like very clean cuts, like very deliberate stuff. And yeah. Wow. That's gnarly. Just stuff you can never imagine like doing to someone that yeah. like you never know happens in, town you live in yeah yeah this is wild um all right so two years in you, you managed to hit canine um what's been your your journey as a canine handler there because there was a an initial canine yeah so i got assigned canine hoss uh and we i basically started over with him like foundationally um all the way down to detection um i had the luxury of being on paternity leave so other than trying to figure out how to be a dad with this baby, they probably shouldn't have let us leave the hospital <laughs> with you because we didn't know what they're doing. I also had this man eater dog that lived in the kennel and in the backyard. Um, started all over just in a Skinner box doing place and heel work and teaching them that all over again and teaching them there's boundaries and there's repercussions if you don't follow these boundaries. Um, had a buddy at the sheriff's office to help me. We didn't go like back to the, basic basic detection stuff but we had to like i had to almost look like he didn't know how to do dope for a second i uh, ended up getting him certified and then we had our first apprehension within 36 hours no oh, shit yeah it was an early one it was hard it's about as textbook as you can get um the bite wasn't super long yeah and it was like clear canine warning the guy still ran send the dog dog bites him handcuffs take the dog off and it was it was what, flawless what was the circumstance uh that you were there in the first place? Uh, it, was a, it was a traffic stop, a felony fleeing, and the guy, like, drove the wrong way with kids in the back of the car and then gets to a house, and um, the UC car saw him. He's wearing, like, yellow pants, so it was clear suspect ID. The guy looked at me, looked at the dog. Haas looked at him, and then it's like, I'm going to run. Okay. And <laughs> I always tell people, the dog's got twice as many legs as you, so he's at yeah. least twice as fast as you. Yeah. And on that day, he was. Yeah. Um. Yeah, we hit the ground running. Um, that dog was that dog was bulletproof to the point where like corrections, like if your timing wasn't right, he was gonna let you know. Yeah, like you you had to be shit hot on what you were doing. Yeah. Well, uh, real quick, when you say f uh, felony stop, does that mean that like the guy has a warrant for him? No, no, no. Like the felony fleeing. So in Georgia, you can have misdemeanor fleeing from the police. Like I just don't stop, but I drive safe arguably without getting into the weeds and then felony fling is like you do stuff that endangers the public like i blow a stop sign and run a red light squeal my tires go 35 miles an hour speed limit this guy went the wrong way the kids aren't even secured in the back of the car like doing it like that's a he would have had a felony warrant for that stuff yeah um if we could id him and all yeah. that kind of nonsense um but then he just went back to the house that the car is registered to yeah it's like people forget we just I at least type in the tag and run it before I stop you, so I at least know kind of who I'm dealing with. Yeah. But you can't do it every time. Right. Sometimes you got to stop a car really quick because what they're doing is so wild. But if you can at least run the tag or, like, have it typed in before you light it up, that way if it flees, you just hit enter. And I'm like, okay, this is probably a good place to go start. Yeah. Yeah, I got you. Okay. Uh, so he bites him, textbook, everything works well, and then would you use him a number of times before uh – so that was his that was his only apprehension. Oh, okay. Um so we got certified in April, I wanna say April is when we got certified. And then I had gotten to a uh, a car accident responding to a, a priority one call in July. Um like a year ago, July. Uh two years ago. Oh two years. So twenty twenty one. Um where Haas did not survive. Um so I had a Kind of had to come to Jesus moment. The next day, I was. Were you banged up? I had a, like a minor concussion, bit my tongue. Um, I think it was just the the circumstances in which the accident happened. The we hit a tree, an older tree, and the tree is always going to win. And the way, just how much room there is in the back of the kennel for the dog to move versus in my I didn't have my seatbelt on, so like, oh, I really? I got jostled around. Um, but there's just far less room to go the way we went being in the driver's seat from wherever Haas was in the back 
and the marks on his head, it looked like he had hit his head off the, uh, like the door popper control arm. Um, Cause I don't know what else back there would make those two specific marks that are at that hinge point. Um, but I was able to get in the back of the car that night. A supervisor showed up, broke my window to get me out. I was able to get in the back of the car with him as he was taking his last couple breaths. One of the one of those one of those nights that like changes everything. Uh, no longer like that. Like I want to go get in, get into it, and, and and make a difference, and be there for like the other officers that need backup and stuff like that, especially with Bolt. But uh, I don't lose any sleep about not getting to a scene in time to catch a guy anymore. Yeah. Um, and that's something I got to deal with all the time. Well, I, I mean, I. I can only, I mean, I can only imagine, you know, how tough it is, but I also think, you know, life is filled with, um, split second decisions where, you know, we, we do the best we can with the information that we have and, and, you know, your heart's where it needs to be, or, you know, you're trying to make a difference and, uh, you know, kind of similarly, you know, no different than the example used overseas where it's like, yeah, I, you know, I, I don't, ever take any solace in the fact that we're putting dogs on a lower rung of the totem pole than human beings. But that's the reality of why we're using them is that if, if that saves a human being, then, you know, then that's, that's part of the gig. And, and in this case, while that may not be a direct action of what happened is that the intent is that, is that, you know, you're trying to get there with a capability to, to help save human lives and, and a bad scenario happened, but you yeah. know, it's not like you were careless, right? I mean, I mean, there are things that could be done better. Well, like there always, always is the case, you know, the, it's like guys give me, like they don't, they don't give me shit purposely with the intent of like the accident, but like they're always like, dude, get out of the way or like drive faster. Yeah. So I, I, I'll, I'll pull my car out of the way, let all the other marked cars go and I'll just get in the stack. Yeah. Um, but it's not like it wasn't, like losing Haas was like a pivotal moment, but then also like the the mortality of it all. Like, what if I died and my kids now don't have a dad? Yeah. Or my my son at the time. I didn't have two at the time, but so it kind of changed a lot of, a lot of perspective True. perspective for me. Um, at that time, I was still in the SWAT team, and that was part of like in my head. I was like, do I need to be doing this too? Um. But the, my wife was actually out of town when that happened. So she got, my buddy called her to tell her I was in an accident. So I'm talking to her on the phone and she's like, was at a bachelorette party? So she's been drinking and I'm trying to explain to her what happened as I'm crying. And uh, she's like, do, you, do I need to come home? I was like, well, unless you can teleport. I don't, you're not gonna be able to make it. I'll be okay. I'm going to the hospital. I gotta, gotta ride back to my house. I just kind of sat on the couch. Um, and then my uh, I swap. Well, my first my canine sergeant texted me the next day, asked me how I was doing, um, and then asked me if I wanted to, like if I was if I wanted to stay on canine. And I told him I don't know. Between between like between witty scare, Benny Benny getting killed, Iris getting blown up, and now this, I was like I don't know if I wanted to lose another dog that's been part like pivotal to me and uh so he let me he's like you don't have to answer now and then my SWAT commander actually called me and uh basically had the same similar discussion that we had about me leaving the department earlier before even getting on canine like will you will you regret it and he goes he, he had a dog that that died from a, an accident at the house um and he said the best thing he did was give it a chance. He goes, you can always, if you get another dog and it's not it, don't don't wonder what if and let that be it. Yeah. Um, so right then is when I made the decision I was going to stay and I'd take another dog. And he made a phone call saying, like, we need to get him a dog now. Like, this can't like, linger. So I was off for two weeks. Uh, went back to work in just like a marked unit capacity, work riding with the proactive guys, like, 
just being a police officer. And then uh, that's when John Brandon actually called me and told me, he asked me if I was going to take another dog. And they told me that he has two that he hasn't bought because he doesn't have anyone to sell them to. So we did the whole bidding process. And I got a week approved to go up to Shallow Creek to test dogs. Uh, he gave me Bolt, Marco at the time, um, put him in the back of the car. I drove up there. So you renamed him Bolt? Yeah. yeah. So we went and did, I just did a little bit of hunt testing. I t- had him bite me. Motherfucker bites hard. I'm like, yeah. And everyone says their dog bites really hard, but taking a handful of bites from dogs and that dog bites really hard. Yeah. I feel bad for the guy that decoys him all the time. Yeah. Because I only let him wear a comp suit. <laughs> yeah. That's good. I, I, I only wear a comp suit. Yeah, That's why I can't. I don't make him do stuff I don't do. Yeah. But the, uh, I just tested them for one day. And it was like, kind of like one of those things, like, you know, you know, I don't know if it's like being overly sentimental about like working dogs, but like, uh, I, don't I told him, I was like, I was like, he's it. Yeah. Like, I don't need to see the other one. I'm going to sleep and I'm going to go home in the morning. I drove back, um, had him certified on dope or certifiable on dope in 18 days. Wow. Like he, he borderline taught himself. Like yeah. he, it was the easiest thing I've ever done. Yeah. Um, he had, he was pre-titled in KNPV. So his, his obedience was really nice. I had to show him, um, like, building search stuff, like, off the trial field. Um, picked everything up really fast. He's super, super clear-headed. Um, kind of made the transition really simple. Like, I kind of felt like, okay, this is, this is, this was the right call. This is where I belong. I, if I didn't, if I did, wouldn't have done this, I would have regretted it. Yeah. Um, I think if I would have gotten a dog that was, like, trying to eat me all the time, it probably would have been different. Yeah. But every now and again, I you can't help but compare one dog to another one. Like, yeah, like I kind of wish you had a little more fire like Hoffs did, or yeah. I kind of wish you did this like Roland did. But for all his like weird little quirks he has, I think he's the right dog. I think he's probably going to be my last working dog. Um, but he's he's super nice. And he, yeah. he, definitely, he definitely brought me – I don't want to say I got to the dark place, but I think he took me off the road I was on to get there. Yeah. Because I don't know – I don't know how bad I would have spiraled. Yeah. And that's not fair to my wife and, and now two sons. Like, they don't yeah. need to see their dad trying to struggle and, and deal with that on his own. Yeah. I mean, do, do you hold yourself accountable for it? I do. Yeah. Um, I do. Um, I mean, it's in, it's in, it's in the GSP report. I ha- so I had it read facing me. Um, what I thought was there's, like, a raised median in the historic area. I didn't see any, like, splash from headlights. So as I'm coming to the intersection, I remember seeing like vivid bright light, like almost like a like the cinematic, like scene by scene by scene. Um, and then we got we got hit. I think it was another intersection. We probably would have just spun out, but because I hit that raised median and rolled the Tahoe, it hit the tree. Um, but I do, and I was could have just could have stopped. Could have could have cleared a hundred times better. Could have done a lot of things. Could have not gone to the call. Could have like. Yeah, it's it's one of those things I'm da- like, I'm always going to think what if. Um, I mean, that goes both ways, though. You know, what if it would have killed you? Yeah. You know, what if uh, it would have killed somebody else or bo- or both of you? Yeah. You know, what if not showing up, um, you know, what would have resulted in something bad with with the call that you were on? I mean, there, there's, you know, to me, it's kind of like comparing yourself to other people. Like there, there's always people with a better deal. There's always people with a worse deal. You know, it could have gone way worse. Yeah. You know, so I think, I mean, believe me, I'm, I'm right there with you. There, there's things that happen that make it really difficult not to, to say what if or oh, I could have done this better or whatever. But again, I, you know, to me, you always go back to intent, you know, the, the intent was not malicious. It was, you're, you're trying to help, you know, and things happen, you know, it's a yeah. dynamic world we live in. And, uh, you know, to me more than anything, like if you're going to, what if it could have gone better, like it could have gone way worse, you know? Yeah. But <clears throat> I think the, I think the, I don't want to call them pros, but like the, the changes like holistically I've made are for the better. Yeah. I, yeah, you hate to have a wake up call, but like, Better that than not invincible. Yeah. Like that feeling you have walking to Target with a C one thirty above your head and two Apaches like yeah. ah, no one's gonna we're <laughs> and a dog. We're, and yeah, we're God's gift to yeah. earth right now. Yeah. Like no no one with walkie talkies and, and an AK that's rusty is gonna win. Yeah. Until they do. Until they do, yeah. Um 
And that was, I mean, unfortunately, that was the wake up call. But that's like driving has changed a lot. Um, that's like the one of the the one of the few moments on a daily basis I get like like the, the pins and needles. Like I I don't like running code anymore. I don't. I got full on, like full on stop. Even like the intersection, there's no like it's four in the morning, no one's there. Like, I come to a complete stop, and like people will pass me and stuff like that. I'll get there when I get there. It'll be okay. The suspect will still be the suspect when I get there. Yeah. Real quick, I have a. a it's probably going to sound, sound like a dumb question. The the term suspect, to me, doesn't make sense most a lot of the time. You know, it's like a dude is running through a fucking shopping center, killing people and. The suspect was shot and killed. Like he's not suspected of anything. He's yeah, he, he's the guy. He's the offender. Yeah. Like why did? Yeah, I don't know. This is like when the media puts out an article and they say the the alleged. Yeah. The alleged <laughs> the video. He's on like video the, doing, doing it. it. Yeah. Yeah. I think everyone's just so worried about like liability of like slander and stuff like yeah. that. Like, if yeah. what if he is found innocent? And you said this on the media. Yeah. Now you're liable for yeah. defamation. Crazy. It's every, the whole world just walks on eggshells now. I know. Yeah, it's nuts. Um, all right, so you get Bolt, Bolt you're uh, firing on all cylinders with him. Uh, have you done many uh, calls with him where, where you've used him? Yeah, so he, ironically, his first live bite was actually a training bite. <laughs> I had, so I'm notorious for just wearing a bite suit top. Yeah. He get you in the legs or what? He didn't get me in the legs. Oh, okay. Another guy was like, oh, I'll just wear the top. Yeah, fuck that. And we were, doing, never... we were doing some vehicle stuff. Took some bite on his on his left arm. Well, I put him, I was showing Bolt, like, people can be under cars. So I send him in on a long line in, like, our SWAT locker. He's laying underneath a Humvee, which just so happened to be Bolt, unless he looked or used his nose, he wasn't going to see him. So I get a nice change of behavior. Bolt goes around the, the back of the Humvee, which I was not expecting him to enter from over there. Well, my buddy is laying with his head facing that way. Bolt's coming this way. So he tries to slide out from under the car. Bolt forgoes the bite suit top, bites him right in the ass cheek. That's fucking classic. So I was like, well, yeah. on the video, his I think his, his, <laughs> his wife or his mom was like, why did the handler say good boy? I was like, he's like, well, he did the right thing. Like, yeah. I was like, it's even awesomer that he didn't yeah. bite the bite equipment, yeah. bit you in the flesh, and was like, this yeah. is it. Yeah. Um, but he's been he's been deployed five times. He's got five, five apprehensions. Wow. And uh, you've only, and you've had him for a year, a year and a half. Wow. Uh, yeah, I got him when he was. I think he was two and a half. He's four, and he turned four in April. Um, he's been very successful. He had a uh, one. He had a, actually had a failed engagement, and I think part of it, like taking a step back from like, because like clearly he bites. It was a, I think it was like a picture issue, and then talking to uh, my buddy Ricky from Spectrum K Nine, like riding the drive roller coaster. Like I had him out of the car the whole time. Like it started as an HR and turned into a barricade. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of riding the roller coaster of drive, like. I'm having him bark at the house during announcements and then telling him to shut up and be in the down and then sending him off lead and sending, using some oppositional reflex for an open air, like, takedown. And it was, like, a, a weird, like, clearly defiant, but, like, half little surrender position. I don't know if he saw that as, like, a like a trial. For, like, I'm going to go into a guard. Yeah. Um, ended up biting the guy when he was fighting. But, like, I was like, ooh. But at first he didn't. Yeah, but I do a whole, now I do a whole lot of like, not a whole lot of, not like, he's not equipment fixated, but I make sure I try and show him as many civil pictures as possible. Like anything I can think of, I just show him. Yeah. He's very, he is almost, he's so clear headed that he, like he, he processes everything all the time. You can almost watch him on video. Like he's thinking more than most Malin was, like where the hamster wheel is just spinning out of control. And it's like, yeah. he's just going out there to bring mayhem to whatever's in front of him. Yeah. I watch Bolt sometimes problem solved too much from like yeah just <laughs> just do it just let your drive take you through the wall like <laughs> please jesus yeah but um it's a unique challenge yeah um but he, he's he's really nice his his detection's really nice he's super calm tracking's probably one of his weaker things and that's just something i just that's mine my fault i just don't work it a lot because yeah. being in a metro area yeah, not the even. likelihood of like he's had he's had two successful tracks like we've been tracking for a while and all of a sudden a dude popped out of the woods and i'm like, yeah, I was even shocked. I looked yeah. at my backup. The only one that made it still, everyone else yeah. fell out. I was like, holy crap, that's him. <laughs> and the guy takes off running. And I was like, oh, I, he had a busy street. I couldn't just send him. Yeah. So we ended up getting the guy. But um, 
if you run with a phone and you like you know everyone on the block, like you're gonna be gone. Like yeah. you're not you're not just still running through the woods. Yeah, yeah. Um, of the of those five bites, can you uh, give us a quick synop- quick synopsis of of how they went? A lot of them were, uh, most of them were just the typical like guys fleeing gets a canine warning. I think there's been some. We've had. <laughs> I have a buddy of mine that he always will say like canine, like basically trying to get someone to surrender through a ruse. I think this guy may have thought I was rusing him because Bolt doesn't bark. Yeah. Unless I tell him to bark or it's like contextual. Like he knows he can bark on my second set of announcements at a door. But like if we're running on a track and all of a sudden I see the guy. He won't start barking. Oh no. Yeah. He just, he goes into overdrive and I made the warning and I just dropped the leash. And on the video, he's like the Velociraptor. Like you see him jumping up through footstep for footstep where the guy went. Yeah. And I had no idea where he went. And all of a sudden, I just kind of heard like, oh, yep, he's biting. <laughs> and then I was like echo location to like the, yeah. the yells and then found the lead and then pulled, took him off. Yeah. Um, I don't know why people don't stop. No, you don't tell me either. canine's coming. I'm yeah. I'm probably not running in the beginning anyway. But Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, in in those five bite location wise, were did, did he target in similar spots or were they all over the? Place? They were all different. Um, so I do and a lot of my tra- I'm very very meticulous about recording in my bite records, like if something was presented or what was taken. And he's very he's very left bicep sure in in the suit or the tricep. Um, and if he bites in the legs, it's always in the rear of the hamstring. Like he's very like almost like overly sport focused. If yeah. you're just like watching him, but then all his bites have been except for one live bite he had was a bicep bite high in the pocket. And that was on me. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell that story in a second. Um, all of them have been foot, butt, calf, forearm. Yeah. And any of them particularly uh, damaging? No, he, he, his bite pressure is nice and he's calm yeah. on the bite where it's just puncture wounds. Yeah. Um, it just, just, they, they don't look bad not going to have a bunch of like tissue damage and all that stuff. Just, yeah. just puncture. I mean, I got bit in the bicep. You can barely tell. You just see the holes where his teeth went in. Yeah. Um, this one was one of those like moments. So what happened? The guy was, uh, breaking into an auto shop trying to steal dirt bikes. And I get on scene first. I just happened to be down the street at the property room and I come in blacked out. And I just see like the one guy jump out from behind the, like over the barbed bar wire fence and fall into the grass at 2 a.m. from the motorcycle dealer. <laughs> so I get out. Not doing anything He wrong. immediately starts running, and I give a canine warning, and I hit the door popper. And it's dark, and Bolt can't see him. So Bolt's just running in the direction I'm running, passes me right into the woods. And the guy went this way. So I recall him as I'm still chasing him, and the guy kind of, like, hides behind a U-Haul truck. I see his foot go up there. So I send Bolt back there. I get a nice proximity alert, but the guy's above Bolt's head. And at that point, I hadn't shown bolt that picture again contextual so yeah. he goes as i pie around the, the truck i see him and he starts yelling like get the fuck away from me and bolt hears it registers i know where this guy is under the u-haul so he goes under the u-haul where he bit my buddy in the butt yeah so now i have this like ethical dilemma of like okay i don't know if this guy's armed still he's clearly not giving up but now if i tell this dude like hey do these things and he decides to comply i still have an off-leash dog so i just go to grab him and he starts to fight well i hip toss him and i end up in like a dominant position on top and i didn't see bolt coming so i pinned him onto his back right as bolt with his come in mouth open misses the guy's tricep full mouth on my bicep did he know and let go quick oh no <laughs> i was I, I thought i thought oh he'll let go. i'm just gonna close and then staple him and then Put him in handcuffs and yeah. it'll be that. Uh uh-uh. uh. He was looking at his brain. Yeah. I was like Los and he like countered. And I was Fuck. like I was like, uh oh. On the camera, my my body camera was right here. And the guy like looks like in his head he's thinking, Oh my god, if the dog did that to him, what would he do to me? And he's yeah. like tries like he shrimps away and starts to run again and patrol gets him. And they get him handcuffed and I hear him, they're like super celebratory, like ten ninety five, he's in handcuffs. And I'm sitting there still being bit by bull, like shit. holding the flat collar. And I was like, someone come over here. <laughs> and they're like, oh, my God, what do I do? I was like, just hold his flat collar for a second. And I grab his dominant collar. I left him off, sit. 
And I look at my arm and I was like, nope, don't look at it. I don't want. <laughs> and it hadn't started hurting yet. Yeah. And I'm looking at Bolt and the guy starts yelling, like, get that dog away from me. And Bolt starts to drag this 110 pound female officer to him. And I was like, one last off. And he laid down. Thankfully for that guy. Yeah. And I had a weight. Luckily, I wear a waist lead for like that. So I have something. Hook him up, put him in the car. As soon as that door closed, just like when I got bit in Odesto Island, pain set in. I'm sitting in the back of the car. like, you're turning real pale. And I was like, oh, yeah, it hurts. Yeah. I was like, I didn't even want to look at it. I was like, is it bad? And there's just punctures, barely bleeding. Yeah. Oh, but it was sore for yeah. a handful, handful of weeks after that. Yeah. It was yeah. a good bite. Yeah, I mean the pressure is fucking hard to hard to deal with. I had my my wrist broken mm. by like a sixty pound male Malinois that uh, you know not not a similar scenario to that. Obviously, it was uh, I was I walked him into a into my garage and he grabbed one of my kids uh, at the time, uh, just like these brand new Ariat. Uh, leather Oops. leather boots and uh, he grabbed one of them and started fucking with it and you know throwing it in his back molars and fucking it up and I told him to let go a couple of times and he didn't and so I was like all right so I went to take him off strong and the second I tried to crisscross his fucking collar he spun around and grabbed my wrist and fucking broke it mm. and same kind of thing it, you know like just a couple of punctures not a ton of a ton of blood but it felt like my wrist had been run over you know, hit with a an truck yeah I mean it was just like throbbing that flashing achy fucking throbby pain or whatever and i was like god damn and i yeah i was wobbly need and with him like i i i hadn't had him a long time so like we weren't super bonded um and i yeah I, I, so i put him out just enough to get him to you know start to go under um and and dropped him and i was like motherfucker and like three seconds later you hear this gasp of air boom and he hits me fucking right again i was like god damn it and so I, I put him all the way under at that point and, and uh, took uh, the leash that he was on, opened the garage door, going inside the house, put the, the handle of the leash on the inside, and then closed the door and got out of, out of range of him and then fell the fuck over. And you know, I was like, holy shit, I was shocky as hell. You well, know? I feel like that's what some things people feel like. You watch a, you watch a dog bite video and it's like... It doesn't look that bad. It's primal. Like yeah. It's like there's a dog eating a human. Yeah. But like... Being on the being on the receiving end many times as you have, it's one of those things where it's like it's not it's not debilitating in yeah. the moment. It's not especially if you know what you're doing. Yeah. It's not debilitating, but it's one of those like it shocks the conscious and it like it breaks that oodle loop. Yeah. But some people think it's like the end all be all. Like I send the dog to bite, and all of a sudden the handcuffs just magically appear on the guy, and it's it's all yeah. done, and he's not going to fight anymore. It's like yeah. They're still gonna fight. People can still shoot you with the dog biting. Like there's yeah. a lot more things that gotta happen. It's yeah. not like the end all be all. Yeah. I think people think it's like the miracle tool. Yeah. Or it's like the or it's so severe. It's like mm. yeah. So much of it depends on the dog too. I mean, some of them, yes. Like some of them are crippling. You know. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've I've seen some and had some that uh, you know, or trained some that ended up going overseas that uh, that had that like legendary. Yeah. grip that you know would fucking cripple or kill people they'd break bones i mean breaking femurs or making people pass out from shock because it, it was so severe but that's rare you know usually it's somewhere in between there yeah. you know and so much of it depends on who they're biting too you know and how strong they are and yeah and or how much crazy resistance they yeah. put into it what their what their mind state is i mean you know, if they're chemically imbalanced with drugs or uh, or even if they're, you know, a twice convicted felon in a three strike state. Yeah, don't want to go back. Yeah, it's like, dude, if, if this dog catches me like that, that level of panic where now that the adrenaline and, and all the other emotions that are going through that person's head of what's going to happen if this dog wins, that changes the fucking game. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, so, I, yeah, I think there's just there's so many intangibles there that are uh, that are varied that that there isn't really a textbook thing I mean, they're a remarkable tool obviously and i i love them to death but uh, but yeah i agree sometimes there's uh, a fair number of misconceptions with them but um so what what now i guess uh, he's four so you're gonna you're gonna ride ride the storm out with him for yeah he's got he's in pretty good health he's got like i feel like he might have a little hip issue from from the injury he got back in december Nothing serious yet, but he's four. I've been kind of trying to model 
the the lifespan of ranger bats dogs to the like there's no like memo or like backstop for the dog so i think eight is a pretty fair age like the dog still has some livability afterwards so like it's not just like it doesn't become like you have this like dog vet burden at yeah. the house where it's like he we wasted some good years he could have enjoyed yeah um so in my head four four years and then make make the next call um i've really been thinking hard about doing the uh the private dog business and just doing uh doing board and trains very small scale nothing i want to scale big um really want to focus on being able to be a dad and coach yeah. little league and stuff like that and i think that i think that's a, a good avenue yeah two or three dogs a month yeah and that's it and like not trying to book myself out and yeah. then it gives the kids something to to learn to do at a young age as well um i have a couple of buddies that are, are are very successful right now in, in the savannah area that are doing that um I think really the sky's the limit. I'm trying to get it in, into teaching a little more now. Um, hopefully have an opportunity coming up at ATK9 um, in conjunction with Southern State K9. Still waiting on further details um, on how involved and what what I'm needed to be doing. Um, but I'm excited for the opportunity. Yeah. Um, anytime I can teach, especially cops. Like I like teaching cops because it's some of them are such a blank slate when it comes to tactics. A lot of guys are just like emulating what they see on TV. Yeah, and that becomes okay. Like you see, there's a lot of videos. So it's no fault of their own where they're pine doors and they're they're doing the Charlie's Angels gun thing and or like just doing weird stuff that they can't explain why tactically yeah. they're doing. They just seen it and they're emulating sure. YouTubers, which yeah. is it's it's fine to an extent, but you gotta you gotta have an, a why to it or or have someone tell you sometimes. Yeah, um, and I'm not afraid to to ruffle feathers if you get upset about it. It's not coming from a bad place. Yeah, I'm trying to help you. Yeah. No, it all sounds good. I, and, uh, yeah, I mean, there's no shortage of work when it comes to training dogs, that's for sure. I mean, there's 90 million of them in the United States, yeah. you know. So um, I think ev everybody in the dog industry could could do board and trains, and there still wouldn't be enough people doing them, you know. But, uh, no, it's all great stuff. Uh, is there anything I haven't asked you that's worth, uh, worth bringing up? Mm. I thought I could think of. What do you want to get off your chest? What do I want to get off? Oh, <laughs> Okay, I was wrong about the initial question. That's the, the hard hitter. Yeah. I don't know. I think I'm I'm pretty other than the couple pitfalls and, and the couple hiccups in my life, I feel like I've I've been able to set my mind to something and achieve and achieve the goal. Yeah. I guess uh reframing it, your kids are super young. Let's say they're watching this when they're when they're teenagers. What's something that you would want want to tell them at that age? As, as they watch this, something, you know, almost like the um, videos where, you know, guys teach their kids how to tie ties and, you know, shit like that. If yeah. in case something happens to them, like what's something you'd want to tell them? I'll say if there's ever anything that you you think you want to do, you don't have to know. If you think you want to do it, invest everything you have into it. Like go, go 100%. Um, if you can't do it wholeheartedly, maybe it's not for you, but dive into everything. Um that's the only way you're going to truly know if it's if it's what you love. That's damn good advice, and I think it's a neat opportunity to to have that on film for them. You know, so I appreciate you sharing that. Thank you. Uh, what what's uh, I guess from a career standpoint um, for you? Are are you able to stay where you're at uh, for the next however many years Bolt has? Yeah. So we don't have like it's not like in it's not like in Ranger Battalion where. You have your 24 to 36 months yeah and you got to go do something else and the dog just goes to someone else generally you'll be the handler until the dog retires um in our policy if the dog retires and you want to stay on the canine unit you have to test again um generally historically either people promote out of the position and the dog gets retired and goes home with them if they've done handled the dog for a decent amount of time yeah or a handler stays on the unit and gets another dog um I think we have two on our canine that have been on it for 20 years. Oh, wow. Yeah, so uh, there's definitely longevity in that. Um, it'll just be a game. I think my wife's ready for me to hang Wind up. It down. Yeah, hang yeah. up the craziness. Yeah, <laughs> well, I mean, that's tough. I mean, the, that is one big difference that you see between law enforcement and military. You know, there are, uh, of course, some obvious similarities, but – you know, the neat thing about the military is it's compartmentalized a lot more. You know, it's like you go overseas for a block of time. It's way the fuck over across the world. You come home. It's it's very separated. 
it's also like while you're home, you're not putting your life on the line day in, day out. Whereas you guys, like, you, you, it's every day. You know, every, every shift you go, you could run into fucking anything. You know? Yeah. And my, my wife jokes. She said she she actually felt more comfortable with me overseas being yeah. surrounded by Rangers. Um, yeah. I kind of I have the luxury of working with some really scored away guys at Savannah right now on the street, like on a daily basis. Um, but every now and again, you get the person on a call with you that their heart's not in it or they have that mentality of like, I'm more worried about being fired than I am about dying. And I think that's a terrible mindset to go into anything with. Um, If you're more worried about what, what like made up rule you might break instead of like surviving, surviving this. And sometimes, sometimes that that gray area is there for a reason. Like make the smart call to live and get written up for something silly. I'm not saying like be egregious, but I'd rather not die. Yeah. And have to have someone explain, but you yeah. did everything by the book. Yeah, yeah, no shit. Do, do you guys run into from a support standpoint? I know you know different departments all over the country. It, it varies pretty drastically, but like support for law enforcement where you're at, do you find uh, that the public is pretty supportive, generally speaking, or is it a, is it challenging environment? There, there are areas where it's challenging, um, and a lot of it comes from just the like in the moment. People got people are upset. Someone's going to jail, so they they just start spitting out talking points they've heard on the news. Yeah. Um, I think it's more of an emotional reaction than it is anything else. I would say, in my experience, like the majority of people I interact with are supportive of law enforcement. Yeah. I think the I think the media construes it yeah totally radical one way that it's not it's not accurate. Yeah, there are I mean there are those loud annoying like you hear the you hear it. Um, and just kind of becomes white noise. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, I've I've had more people reach out, shake my hand, tell me they appreciate what we do, and being at like uh, community events with Bolt, he's super social, so I, I yeah. get him out and let kids play fetch with him and stuff oh, like that's that. Cool. Like he's he was on the like the one of the motorcycles taking pictures, and kids are holding the leash and healing with them and stuff. So, yeah, that's awesome. Um, he's like the utility dog, and they they, they can't believe it. They're like, oh, I, yeah. I never thought a police dog would be like this, and I go. Yeah. They're not just this rabid dog. The yeah. dog is doing its job. Yeah, some of them can be, but some of them can be. But he's like yeah. the uh, he's like the golden egg. That's like yeah. nice to be like, look, yeah, this dog can yeah. do everything. Perfect demo dog. I love it. All right, in keeping in tradition with uh, mic drop guests, we like to have a, a parting gift. So, uh, Champion Choice Silver and John Johnson are hooking all the guests up with the uh, stereotypical challenge coin to commemorate your uh, your time here, as well as a. A buckle for you to uh, to take home with you and rock when you go line dancing with the old lady. So uh, we appreciate uh, Champion Choice Silver and, and John for uh, for all the support and uh, and hope you have something to remember the show by. So thank you very much. Well, man, I uh, I can't thank you enough again for taking time out of your busy schedule and, and coming here. I know it's a, a quick turnaround for you and a busy one. And uh, you know, to me, I, my hats off to you. I have the utmost respect for both military service and and what you're doing now and and I just want to thank you for doing both of those things. I appreciate you having me on. This is this is awesome and one of those once in a lifetime things. Oh, so, dude, it's a, it's an honor to have you here. No no bullshit. So, uh, for the listener, um, you know, it's men like John here that give us the ability to live the the way that we live. And uh, you know, to me, it's crucial to to you know give a, a platform to to hear your story and and have it be told and and get exposure to to guys like you all over the the country that that continue to put your life on the line for dipshits like us. So we appreciate you. Uh, If you didn't enjoy it, you know, you get to choke yourself. And uh, I do want to say thank you for the support, Uh, you know, week after week, show after show. The uh, the support that we get from you guys is is why we continue to to be able to bring these shows to you. So thank you for, for tuning in. We do appreciate it. And until next time, this is Mike Drop. 